Welcome back. Today I'm doing an update on Mastercraft. So I did a video on them about six months ago. And of course I bought some at around like I think like $28 a share. Literally uh, what happened was it dropped I think from like 30 to 20. And I was like, hey, good time to buy. It's dropping, right? No, it just continued to drop. Now I did use the opportunity to add more to where my cost basis is actually in the low 20s, which is good. But uh, I'm telling you this because Whenever somebody owns a stock, they're much more likely to have a positive view on it. So we can't help that. So just take what I say with a grain of salt. You should do your own research. But that being said, I want to show you the reasons why I like it and why it's turned into kind of a big position for me. All right, let's get started. So in my last video, this is pretty much what I did. I went to the financials, went to the cash flow, um, looked at free cash flow per share. Where is it down here? Yeah, saw it was like... 281, 590, 2, and I said, oh shoot, man, as, as long as they like maintain this three and grow, then then it's a no-brainer, right? And you know, that was probably not a deep enough dive, which is why I only had a small position. But what I want to do now is go through the kind of visual graphic approach that I normally use for stocks. Okay, so let's let's do that. Let's go to the income statement. Okay, so first thing is gonna be total revenue and we're going to look at the income statement briefly and then I'm going to come back to it at the end to help value the, the company. Okay, so this is huge, right? I mean, a huge drop. Uh, the last two quarters have been not good. Uh, that being said, the fact, and you're going to see it, that they were still able to make money in these terrible revenue quarters is pretty impressive. Okay, so revenue dropped, uh, probably just cyclical, right? Interest rates went up. People are not buying boats, but the idea is that hopefully whenever it recovers that uh, you're in at a low price, right? Okay, but we'll go over that. I just wanna show you net income because I think this is interest, not net income, earnings per share, diluted earnings per share. Okay, so, you know, compared to that COVID year where they lost, um, and I'm gonna need to add some decimals here, where they lost, you know, they had the other drop in revenue, they had a big drop in earnings per share, but here, even with that revenue drop, you're seeing still able to earn some income, right? Keep in mind that the average of the at last eight quarters has been roughly 80 cents per share. It's been right in this ballpark, okay? Now, I wanna show you the cash flow statement though, because this is interesting. So I look at three things, right? Operating cash flow, which you wanna make sure that that's growing. Uh, you don't really care about uh, consistency here from a quarterly standpoint, because cash is gonna bounce around a lot. Um, so operating cash flow, then I look at uh, investing cash flow, or I'll do financing first. Financing cash flow I love to look at because I want to make sure this is negative because this is them returning value to shareholders. They're either paying debt or paying dividends or buying back shares. In their case, it's a share buyback program. So you can see that they're repurchasing a lot of stock um, recently. I mean, just the last four quarters repurchased. 24 million dollars of stock okay so four quarters that's one year right so the repurchases alone if they were done at let's just say the current market cap uh 24 divided by 374 so that's the dollars of repurchases divided by the market cap that's a six and a half percent return so that alone you're getting about a six and a half percent return which is really good right um so I think that that's great. That's one thing that I really like is seeing share repurchases. The other thing is no debt, but we'll get to that. Um, one thing that's interesting though, uh, I have adjusted free cash flow per share. So what do I mean by adjusted free cash flow? This is adjusted for stock-based compensation. So free cash flow adds stock-based compensation back in. I like to subtract it, so I adjust that. I sum the last four quarters, divide by the number of shares. Okay, so that gives me a free cash flow per share. What I don't like is that this is kind of on a downward trajectory, right, compared to the earnings per share. I'm going to show you the earnings per share again. So this is going up, and then the, the free cash flow per share is kind of going down. Now, you had this huge spike, which, you know, maybe if we take an average, it about works out. But still, what's going on, right? Uh, what's happening is high capital expenditures. So um, if I look at CapEx, they're just spending a lot more in CapEx than they used to, right? So uh, that's going to hurt free cash flow. Is this a bad thing? Most of the time, if it's forced capital expenditures, it's a bad thing. Some people would say high CapEx is always bad. I think that that's mostly true, except if you're able to get a high return on assets, meaning 
you know, whenever you spend money on CapEx, you're buying new assets. If you're able to deploy capital and then get a high return on those assets, then it's actually a better place to put your money than other conventional places like even paying down debt or buying back shares. Now, the other two are pretty much guaranteed. Well, I'd say that guaranteed returns are paying debt and paying dividends, but you know, CapEx can be good if you're if you're buying things that are going to increase your income later on. OK, so the way that I'm going to judge the quality of the CapEx and a good way to just in general judge capital allocation of management is to look at return on assets. OK, so I'm going to jump to the balance sheet to go over that. So for the balance sheet, first off, total assets growing. OK, so we knew that was going to be the case because they're just spending ever increasing amounts on CapEx. Right. So assets are growing. Uh, so what I want to look at is the trailing 12 months pre-tax income return on tangible assets. Okay, I know that that's a lot of words. Basically, it's your pre-tax income every on the trailing 12 months basis divided by the number of assets. Okay, and what you're getting is uh, like over 20 percent. I mean, even these down years, you're you're still making. I'm sorry, in the up years, you're making over 30% on assets. That's crazy good, okay? The down years, or that the down quarters recently have been more like 20, and you had this one section here in 2020 that was uh, negative whenever you were losing money. But in general, I mean, really high return on assets. And I mean, this would be a satisfactory return on equity. I mean, I take that back. This would be a great return on equity, 22%. To have the... Um, a return on assets this high is super impressive and it shows that the capex is actually good investments right or at least on paper um you can look at free cash flow return on assets kind of the same thing um it's lower like we talked about but if i take an average let's see i'm gonna i'm gonna take this average from like from this 17 percent to current so that's uh that's an average of 23 percent so 23% free cash flow return on assets, really strong, right? Okay. Anyway, um, let's run through some other stuff with the balance sheet. So uh, first thing is total debt. Let me show you that. Long-term debt. I mean, it's, it's really low. I mean, $40 million, close to $40 million on assets of... 350 million dollars so you're in a very good position from a debt perspective and i think this is so interesting i'm gonna jump to the income statement real quick because i think this is so neat watch this watch your interest um this is your net interest expense so your interest expense is actually higher okay so you're gaining money through interest Whereas previously you were losing money because you were paying interest on your debt and when you still have debt, but what's going on is that they have more interest from their investments that they're bringing in than they do on their debt. And so what am I talking about? If you look here on the balance sheet, um, the current assets they have, uh, let's see. Yeah, they well, I'd have to show you their 10 Q, but anyway, they hold a lot of corporate bonds. So, you know, they're making more money on that than they are on the debt that they owe. So, pretty pretty good you know that's kind of what you want next up i want to show you repurchases because i think that this is i mean we kind of already went through it but i want to show you what it does to the uh share number i mean we went through the the monetary value but i mean look at these shares just really coming down i mean you're, you're talking about and we're going to use this later on at this rate i mean you're going down five hundred thousand shares per year if you're a shareholder you want them to continue the repurchases and you want the stock to stay low, right? Because if the stock stays low, then every dollar that they spend buys more shares, right? So anyway, I mean, you're looking at probably 16 and a half million by the end of the year of shares outstanding. Uh, they have a $50 million share authorization, which would be a significant portion of the market cap as well, right? Okay, that's the balance sheet. I want to show you the income statement again, but this time we're going to use it to get a valuation. Okay. So the way I'm going to do this is we're going to say, uh, use revenue and some of our expenses to try to break down what we think the earnings per share are going to be. And then put a PE on that to, to say what we think the stock's going to be valued at in a few years. Right. So it's going to be the predicted model. And let me pull that up. This is basically how it's going to work. I'm going to put the revenue in, I'm going to put our gross margin in that we think is going to be uh, the case. 
per operating expenses. It, basically, we're just building out a future uh, earnings, right? Okay, so we'll go step by step through it uh, just to kind of show you because I think that this is a good exercise, if nothing else, and you could do this with other stocks. So first off, revenue. Where do we think revenue is going to be in, in, in a year or two? I mean, I, I think that it's obvious that this is a short-term cyclical downturn and that the trajectory has been up, right? So look, I'm going to be conservative and say that they'll easily get back to 150 per quarter in revenue. Okay, so 150 per quarter is going to be uh, 600, right? I just did that in the calculator. So back in our model, we're going to put 600 million per year in revenue, okay? Gross margin. All right, so I'm going to go back to this and look at what has the gross margin been historically, all right? So historically, it's been pretty high. Now, it has been shrinking, and it's been down these recent quarters. So what do we think is going to be going on, you know, two or three years from now? I'm going to be a little more conservative here. I'm not going to predict that we go back to the 25%. I'm going to say maybe we split the difference, maybe 23%, let's say, okay? So I'm going to put 23% there, 23%. Okay, and that gives us a variable profit or, you know, a gross margin of $138 million per year. All right, operating expenses. Let me go over those. So what has the, what have those been historically? Okay, operating expenses. This is something that I just think is really neat. So to have your revenue growing like it's been growing, but you're really keeping your operating uh, expenses low is just a great sign unfortunately what you see with a lot of companies is that as revenue goes their operating income just or operating expenses just grows with it to where uh you know these are supposed to be fixed costs the only thing supposed to grow with your uh, revenue is going to be your variable cost so the fact that their fixed costs are roughly fixed is in my opinion a really good thing so recently it's been about look less than 12 million dollars per quarter but historically 12 to 14 okay so I'm going to go at the high end of that. I'm going to say $14 million per quarter. So go back to the model, and this is going to equal negative uh, 14 times 4 because it's per quarter and negative because it's an expense. So that gives me $82 million of operating income. Okay, interest and other. We'll go through that real quick. So interest expense, we already talked about that. It's actually not an expense. You're actually getting money from interest, about half a million dollars a quarter. So two million dollars a year right half a million per quarter times four is two million dollars and then we really don't have any other income or expense this is roughly zero right so we're just going to put a plus two here because it's plus two per year tax rate similar thing to the gross margin usually this is going to be 21 percent for the uh for for most u.s companies but you might see a little bit of fluctuation um it's roughly 21 22 percent okay so we'll do 22%, 22%, not 30. Okay, that gives me net income of $66 million. Okay, we talked about the number of shares. Right now they have about 17 million shares outstanding, but I think that they're gonna get to 16 and a half. So 16.5, okay, that gives the earnings per share of 397, okay? So it's just crazy. I mean, what PE do we wanna put there? Let's say optimistically a PE of 12, that's stock price $48 a share. That's kind of my high end scenario in my last video too. I think I think this is probably the high end, you know, pretty double digit PE uh, revenue. But remember the revenue, that I wasn't even assuming it went up that much. I said it was gonna be 150 per quarter. Um, and if you look at it, it would have to, I mean, if it continues on the growth, it could be higher than that, right? So I feel pretty comfortable with, with this one, but I wanna also look at it from a lower uh, perspective, right? So. Instead of 600 million, let's say 500 million in revenue, okay? And let's reduce that gross margin. So let's say it's 21% instead of 23. Operating expenses, we're gonna keep it that minus 14, keep everything else the same, um, and lower the PE. So if I lower the PE to 10 in this scenario, $24 a share. Um, if I lower it to eight, now we're now we're kind of where we are okay so in my opinion i think that this is probably too conservative but even if or you know this is a this would be bad for the company right if they if they perform this way it probably wouldn't be good but even this scenario is still very good downside protection and that's what i really like about the stock is that i feel like you have this really high floor because you have no debt you're buying back shares and you have pretty good discipline with the operating expenses right so to me this is just an asymmetric play where 
uh, the you know if, if the revenue continues growing like it is and they and they stay disciplined with their operating expenses, you could get an even higher uh, stock price, right? So anyway, that's that's just my two cents on it. Like I said, I encourage everybody to do their own research. Please comment. Let me know what you think. Did I miss something? Am I being too optimistic? Also, let me know if you have any suggestions for other stocks. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.